Uh, I would like to say two things. One, I'm going to steal all of your slides. So I, I'm getting permission. Said that like 52 times on your slide. <laughs> Number two, I, I think uh, circul I know circulating tumor DNA is going to make a huge change because it fits in with what else is happening in medicine. And that, that'll be my talk next year so that I'm ahead of you, AI in medicine. But AI is like big in everything these days. And you hear how it's going to replace pathologists and replace everyone. That's great. We can be, you know, having... Uh, drinks while we have AI give our talks next year, but it's truly the way to take all of this data and be able to segregate it uh, between tumors and utilize it to evaluate data that we get from everywhere. By the way, also I have, while you were up here, I have trademarked science of the obvious. Yes, I love that. I'm going to use that all the time. Um, and we can go from there. I got to do one thing as I introduce the next speaker who's I bring all the time because he's not just a doctor, he's a psychologist. And when I bring him in, he helps my psyche. But, but also, it's great. This is not good enough for him. He's taller than me. There we go. Uh, Dr. Sullivan and I, I met somewhere at some point, and <laughs> I can never remember, but uh, as always, uh, you know, these meetings are are for all of us to get to know each other. We all have a connection in one way or another and to learn how to change our our therapies and how we take care of patients, even from the beginning. Um, we've made a major change here and in other places that as soon as you're diagnosed in, in post-surgery or early diagnosis, we do use circulating tumor DNA and move forward. Um, but at some point, that's not helpful. At some point, you've already seen your neoadjuvant and adjuvant approach. You've already gotten your first line of therapy and you've, you've, you've come here and I've thrown everything at you and you say, well, what's next? And that one, what's next is gonna be um, expertly uh, introduced to you by Dr. Sullivan, who's assistant professor at uh, Harvard Medical School and at Mass General. And so I'm impressed and also very um, comforted in knowing that you're here and should talk to us. So come on up. So, so thank you very kindly for that introduction. Um, I once had a patient tell me that I was very soothing, like. Dr. Hamid just did, and I said I was 185 pounds of Ativan. <laughs> that was 10 years ago, so I'm probably now 185 pounds of Ativan and 10 to 15 pounds of bad decisions. Um, however, it is a great pleasure to be here, and I look forward to talking to you about, um, again, a, a Hamid special uh, in terms of titles. I love it, though. Clinical trial options, new data, future therapies. Um, here are my relevant disclosures. I have one more disclosure. I've been getting a lot of flack about the size of my phone and the color of my phone. It, I have a small phone and it's red and I love it. So that's it. All right, let's talk a little bit now about melanoma. So we've heard lovely talks so far this morning describing a lot of the data that informs this uh, figure. So essentially, We've made a lot of progress in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, we have drugs in black that are the immune checkpoint inhibitors or immune therapies on some level. We have drugs in red that target BRAF. Um, and there are other diseases over the last 15 years that have had similar revolutions, but not many. Um, and I think the thing that's so amazing about this figure is the left side of the figure, which is so sparse, because essentially all the benefits of the 20th century in terms of therapy to treat cancer didn't help the great majority of melanoma patients, but yet the therapies that are helping patients um, with cancer in 2023 were actually originated uh, in melanoma, in our melanoma patients. So that's 
that's the, the backdrop to this slide, which is essentially, okay, we've had success. What else do we need to do? I think it's important to note that all the data that led to all the approvals of those now black um, words on the left side of the slide were obtained from patients who were treated right after they were diagnosed with metastatic disease. So that's not like they had something first and then went on those treatments. Some of the data involved some of that, but mostly it were patients who hadn't been treated before. And so the question in terms of an unmet need is, well, what do we do after we try one of those things? And it doesn't work because these drugs don't help everybody, unfortunately. And so I think one of the major unmet needs is what do we do second or third or fourth or fifth in patients after they've received all that stuff? Additionally, we need optimal treatment selection and and Dr. Patel talked a little bit about treatment selection, and we need better frontline therapies. I'm not going to talk a whole lot much more about that, but it's still an unmet need until we're curing almost everybody. There'll be an unmet need to improve our frontline treatments. And then third, we need better therapies for uveal, acral, and mucosal melanoma patients, patients who don't have the same benefit from those upfront therapies. Some do, but most don't. Um, and so we need better therapy set. I'm not going to talk a lot about that either. Oh, that's great. I love feedback, um, both from sort of the auditory feedback as well as if you have feedback about my talk, that's fine. If you like the jokes, great. If you don't, that's okay too. Um, although I don't like that feedback. Um, okay, so let's focus here. So I'm going to break down the talk, essentially talking about unmet needs in two different ways. One, I'm going to talk about targeted therapy, um, and one I'm going to talk about very briefly new immune therapies. So we'll start with targeted therapy. So what is targeted therapy? Well, targeted therapy is in sort of a boiled down version, drugs, typically pills that focus very specifically on blocking what we call an oncogene. Gene is a gene that becomes a protein that drives tumor growth. Uh, these are uh, throughout all cancers, you can identify oncogenes. Some of the most common oncogenes in cancer are also the most common oncogenes in melanoma. Uh, RAF and specifically BRAF mutations, which turn on the gene and drive the cancer, are present in about half of patients with skin melanoma. NRAS mutations are present in about a quarter, and they tend not to overlap. So if you have a BRAF mutation, you probably won't have an NRAS mutation. If you have an NRAS mutation, you probably won't have a BRAF mutation. And what they do is they activate this pathway. And this pathway, when activated, is a whole bunch of things, including preventing cells from dying, helping cells evade the immune system, helping cells recruit new blood vessels, uh, and, and leading to, to cell growth. And most of the focus so far has been on blocking those mediators that are in the rectangle. I'm not going to show you any of the data. Um, I'm just going to summarize what the frontline BRAF inhibitor therapy does. Uh, we now have three combinations. I don't, I don't know why I put two fingers up. Three combinations of two drugs um, that are better than one drug. And that's BRAF and MEK. So if you kind of go back and you look at MEK and RAF, uh, so double blocking is better than single blocking. A subset of patients treated with these in the front line do amazingly well and are alive and their disease hasn't grown for five years, eight years, 10 years. I still have two or three patients on the phase one trial of oncorafinib and binimetinib. We still have a few patients in our clinic from the phase one trial of Debra. Those trials launched in 2013 and 2010, respectively, at our institution. So these can be long-lasting effects, but most patients don't have that benefit. Uh, we now have a prospective, we now have prospective randomized data. Dr. Patel showed it very quickly uh, from the DreamSeq study that suggests that immunotherapy is better than BRAF targeted therapy. If you're talking about first, first line treatment. Uh, and we also have three trials that show that BRAF and MEK plus immune therapy is a little bit better than BRAF-MEK combinations, 
but one of the three trials, only one of the three trials was strong enough statistically to be positive. It led to an FDA approval of a regimen that not choose, which is sad because it was like one of my best papers of all time. And I'll, okay. So what's, what does it mean now? Well, here's that little box is important because if a patient is treated with immune therapy first, and it doesn't help them, there will be a role for targeted therapy in that patient and in every patient with metastatic BRAF mutant melanoma who's not cured with immune therapy. It's probably, it's not criminal, but it's sort of close to that. If a patient, there can be times where it, it just can't happen, but almost every patient with a BRAF mutation that hasn't benefited from immune therapy should receive BRAF targeted therapy. So this was alluded to by Dr. Patel and I alluded to it this time. I'm not gonna show the data, but I'm just gonna show you the schema of this trial. So this trial, the DreamSeq, randomized patients who are newly diagnosed with BRAF mutated melanoma to either get epilimumab nivolumab or to get Dabraf and trametinib. So combination immune therapy or combination BRAF targeted therapy. And then when they progress, they could go to the other thing. And so if you've got epinevo, you could get Dabtram. If you got Dabtram, you get epinevo. A positive trial at two years, you're way more likely to be alive, alive, not like alive without disease, alive if you were randomized to epinevo than if you were randomized to Dabrafinib trametinib. But what's interesting, um, and so this is a plot, just it's a little weird, but it's showing response rates if you got arm A, which was immunotherapy first, arm B, which is targeted therapy first, arm C, which was the patients who switched to targeted therapy after they got immunotherapy, or arm D was the reverse. The response rate for targeted therapy is quite similar whether you received it before, like it was as, as the front line, or if you received it as the second line, which is encouraging because it suggests that not only should everybody have a chance of getting it, but it actually might be about as effective. So the problem, however, with BRAF targeted therapy is that resistance happens. Um, and it happens in most patients. And a lot of mechanisms have been described. Um, one mechanism that we and others described was that the, the machinery to make a cell die can be co-opted and that process can be prevented in cancer cells. So the way our body is, is is all of our cells have the capability to just destruct. And it's a good thing that our cells can self-destruct because let's say that cells start to become a cancer cell, we can self-destruct that cell and then we don't develop that cancer that we could have developed. Or we get infected with a bad virus or something, we can self-destruct those cells. And so that's a very important and healthy process of normal, we call it programmed cell death or apoptosis. And cancer generally does something to prevent that process from happening so that they can be immortalized. So we actually did a trial, uh, and Dr. Patel was part of this study, uh, where we looked at debrafidib trametinib, so BRAFIMEC and Nivitoclax, which blocks, or actually blocks some of the ways that the cancer might prevent apoptosis, which said another way, it can facilitate cell death. Um, and we looked at this and we did a phase one trial and we looked at a bunch of doses and we identified a dose and that was exciting. And then we did a randomized trial. Uh, and this is sponsored by the, the, the NCI, the National Cancer Institute. Uh, and our primary endpoints were like, we wanted to see, can this regimen better at reducing tumor quickly um, compared to debrafinotrametin alone? Um, and we had a bunch of other endpoints as well. And Ultimately, this is going to be presented for the first time a month from now, not now. Um, but the the sort of in parentheses line is it seems to work a little bit better in some patients, and we're trying to figure out who those patients are. And so it's not going to be the greatest thing ever, but it may help us lead to better approaches, more targeted approaches. Nivitoclax has a few different things it blocks, 
Um, and there are other things that, that, that one of those three that it typically blocks might be more important than others. And so if we have a more specific inhibitor, we might actually have a better outcome. Okay. So the other thing that's, that's been tried time and time again is just hammering at this pathway. And so just sledgehammering RAF, sledgehammering MAC, sledgehammering ERC. And more recently, you notice how there's two different RAFs up there. There's a red RAF and then sort of a brown RAF. And the brown RAF, there's two of them. And the red RAF, there's one of them. The red RAF is how the mutated BRAF in melanoma signals. There's only one, it turns on, and you only need one of them. In all of our other normal cells or in tumors that are driven above that, it actually does what's called a dimer. There's two RAFs that put together, um, and then that leads to signaling. And it turns out that you can develop BRAF inhibitors that are better at blocking one RAF or better at blocking the two RAF. And so there's emerging data with BRAF dimer, so two RAF inhibitors, or ERK inhibitors, which is downstream. So you can see the last sledgehammer is, is hammering ERK. The middle sledgehammer is, is hammering MEC. Um, and these are called waterfall plots. So down is good, up is bad. So down means the tumors are getting smaller, up means the tumors are getting bigger. Um, and now we have at least some data with ERK inhibitors and MEC inhibitors. We've had that for a while, but now we have data with a number of RAF dimer inhibitors that show improvement in melanoma and other cancers when in tumors that are driven by RAF or driven by RAS. And in the bottom there is an NRAS mutant population where there's two drugs, a RAF dimer and a MEC inhibitor. These are all the combinations of RAF dimer and MEC inhibitors that are, or ERK inhibitors that are making their way through clinical trials. And so it's, it's exciting that we're now finally finding drugs that seem better uh, at blocking that pathway. And it may actually be useful in treating patients who have NRAS mutant melanoma, but also have BRAF mutant melanoma that's progressed after BRAF targeted therapy. Uh, this is uh, one such study that was presented uh, in Paris uh, back in September. Um, and what you can see is that big star in blue, that's the RAF inhibitor that was used in all the combinations, and that's called naparafinib. Um, and then <clears throat> there's a yellow star at MEC, and that the MEC inhibitor is called trametinib. There's a yellow star at ERK, and the ERK inhibitor is called hmm, rinaturkib, something like that. Uh, and then the, there's one on CDK4 and there's ribocyclin, is that drug? That's actually a drug that's FDA approved for breast cancer. So this trial looked to, to combine um, the, the RAF inhibitor with all of those others. Um, and what was shown was if you look in the bottom right, BRAF mutated cancers didn't respond all that well. So these were patients who had been on BRAF inhibitors before, they went on this and it didn't really help. Interestingly, there was data just presented a month ago at AACR with a different PANRAF inhibitor by itself, and it showed actually pretty good responses in that, which suggests that all RAF dimer inhibitors aren't created equal. They may have different ways of blocking the pathway so that it may be more effective for, say, NRAS mutant tumors, which if you look at the bottom right, all the way on the right, there's more down and more deeper down. Um, in, in those with all three of the combinations. Now, this is not without cost. Um, the drugs were paid for on the study, um, but the human price was in mostly rash. And almost every patient had a rash. Many patients had a bad rash. Um, and it got to the point where patients who were treated on this trial had to start pills to prevent a rash because the rash was so prevalent. Um, we think we can do better than that, and we're working on that in some of the newer studies, uh, but it's, it's certainly uh, it's one of the things that we have to overcome when we use these combinations. So to summarize the targeted therapy portion, then I just have probably a few minutes on the immunotherapy portion. There's a role for BRAF targeted therapy for every patient with BRAF mutant melanoma. Fortunately, some patients don't need it because they get immunotherapy and their disease doesn't come back. There's a better understanding of uh, BRAF melanoma biology is leading to hopefully improved BRAF targeted therapies. And I talked a little bit about our Nevitoclax study. 
And then there are new targeted therapy strategies emerging to treat BRAF, NRAS, and other oncogene-driven populations of melanoma, mostly focused on blocking that, that double RAF or RAF dimer. So in the last few minutes, I'll talk about new immunotherapies. So uh, you're going to hear more about this for sure from Dr. Memi. Uh, Tabentafusp is a drug that got FDA approved for uveal melanoma uh, in uh, January 2022. Um, it's a very interesting molecule. Uh, it looks a lot like a T-cell receptor. T-cell receptors are the part of the T-cell that recognizes stuff. Uh, and in this scenario, it recognizes a small little piece of a protein that's often present in melanoma cells. So it binds to that. On the other end of the molecule, it can attract in a T cell, and then it brings them together. And I like to think of this as like evil matchmaker. Um, it's good for the patient, but it's not so good for the cancer cell. Um, in any event, this drug works. Um, Dr. Patel showed you the data with the ctDNA from um, from the the trial where patients had already been treated with something else. Uh, in the trial on the left. Uh, these were patients who had been first treated. The first treatment for uveal melanoma was this. And actually, there's an even steeper reduction uh, in ctDNA. Um, we also, it's a weird drug. It doesn't lead to responses in most patients, but patients actually have benefit. And by benefit, like they live longer. Uh, and they actually tolerate this quite well. And so treating beyond the scans looking bad uh, is something that that probably can be helpful. And trying to wonder, well, maybe we can use the ctDNA to do that. So why am I talking about uveal melanoma? Well, it turns out that our fearless leader, Dr. Hamid, um, and others have worked on this drug in patients with skin melanoma uh, and giving it in combination with the other immune therapies. In this case, it was a pdl one inhibitor. Um, and what you can see, this is called a spider plot. Uh, and I mean, technically, it only should be a spider plot if there's eight patients on the arms but no worries. Um, and so what you can see here is that, so down is good. That means their tumors are getting smaller. Long is even better because it means uh, tumors are getting smaller and staying smaller for a while. And I put that dotted line at 12 months. And so there's a significant number of patients that are surviving with control of disease after a year. And if you can see, there's two different colored lines. There's red lines and blue lines. The red lines are patients who had had PD-1 or PDL one inhibitors already. So those are patients who actually were resistant to the standard of care, and now they're getting treated, and, and some of those patients are having long-term control of their disease. So this is pretty exciting. It was so exciting that there's now a new clinical trial. We actually put the first patient on the trial in the world at MGH on Tuesday, um, and this is a trial that's trying to build upon Dr. Hamid and others' data Patients, um, arm A is Tabentafus, arm B is the combination, arm C is you can, you're just being followed. And now why would they allow the control arm of a trial to just be followed? Well, again, the issue with this drug is that a lot of patients don't respond, uh, but still will have benefit. And so they're looking at, at, at the, that part of the study is looking at how long do patients live and they're comparing it. And so, so it's actually you can do whatever you want with those patients. And actually what we're doing is we're rolling them onto a different clinical trial, which is totally allowable on this study. Um, now there's a two fold thing. And the reason I mentioned the ctDNA is once they get through the, the first part of the study, which ironically is called phase two, um, then they're gonna look at all the data. And one of the things they're gonna look at is, is the ctDNA going down. So it's not only is it have this novel thing about we can treat patients on the control arm on another clinical trial, but the endpoint is novel. Are two, is ctDNA going down? Is it going more with the combination of an anti-PD-1? In this case, it's pembrolizumab versus tabentafus. Is it similar? Do we not need the anti-PD-1 arm? Do we, should we just get rid of the tabentafus arm? Those decisions will be made as it transitions to the second part of the study, which is the phase three. Um, also in the phase three, patients who are randomized to the control arm will also be able to go on to other clinical trials. So it's a cool study. Well, what are we going to do? What other trials are we thinking about in patients that aren't going on to that trial? Well, this is, we're building upon a concept. The concept is that if you freeze tumors, you might augment a, an immune response. Uh, you might hear a little bit about radiation uh, augmenting immune responses, but freezing stuff also can do that too. 
Um, we previously did a trial where we looked at patients who were on a PD-1 inhibitor, their tumors were growing, and we put them on uh, this study where we uh, froze one growing lesion, continued their immune therapy, and then followed them out for a few cycles of, of, of treatment and scans. Um, and what we found, and this was led by Megan Meradian, who's one of our medical oncologists, Florian Fintelman, who's one of our radiologists who, who freezes stuff. Um, and we ultimately screened 20, 18 were like treated on protocol because two patients did amazingly well and, and didn't actually need the cryo. Um, and we had three patients who had responses. Now that's not amazing. We had another five that had control of their disease for a while. So that's a little bit better. Um, but again, all of these patients' tumors were growing. And what we identified is that if we actually freeze one of the tumors, very commonly the tumors get smaller, but also patients could remain either in stable disease or in a partial response that lasted a while. And we're currently reanalyzing um, a lot of the tumor biopsies and blood, and hopefully we'll get this out soon as, as a publication. We're building on that. And now what we're doing is patients who re either receive PD-1 inhibitor or uh, nivolumab or latlamab, which you heard of. Um, and then progress, we're going to move straight to this, which is giving IPI and NEVO and freezing a tumor and then seeing if we get better outcomes there. So with that, um, again, this is the unmet need that we talked about, and I thank you for your attention.